I said this earlier, and I'll, I'll say it again. I think what Jim Nagy has done with the Senior Bowl is one of the great marketing efforts of all time, and I mean that in a really positive way. Yeah, He's turned it really into something, and some of that is – you know, through his just personal effort and love of the product. And some of it is the amount of success they've had with it, the people they've had to go to it, and what it's done to help NFL teams make their decisions in the draft. So I say that to butter him up so he'll give us the best <laughs> answers imaginable. Jim Nagy joining us right now. Hello, sir. How are you? <laughs> uh, doing great. Doing great. No, very, very kind of you. Um, the game's been great forever. It, it just, it wasn't, you know, it was kind of under marketed for lack of a better phrase. So just, you know, we, we have worked hard on this and really through social media, everyone's on their phones now. Right. So, so we've been, we've been hitting the social thing hard now for almost six years and, uh, and it's starting to grow. You can feel it. It had a different feel this year, even than last year. Is that kind of mirroring the NFL and realizing that, sure, that the actual product of football is awesome, but that doesn't mean we don't have to consistently in every day do all we can mm-hmm. to kind of grow the brand and, and market the product? You know, Brock, the biggest thing was when I, when I took the job, I had a lot of friends in the agent community who I knew when I was, when I was scouting. They were like, man, you need to, you need to wrestle the, the power away from us. You know, as great as the Senior Bowl is, like too many players got invites and didn't really know about the Senior Bowl. Um, so that's been the, that's been the, the, you know, the aim for the last five or six years has been to just really promote these guys. And, and so when they do get their, you know, promote them from the spring, we watch the tape and in the spring and the summer, and then we, you know, we're out at our staff is out of games through the fall and we're just pushing these guys, pushing these guys. So then when they get their invites, at least they know about us, right? <laughs> at least they yeah. know about the senior bowl and what it's all about. And, um, I do feel like your best recruiters are, are the guys that go before you too. So now we've got, you know, five or six classes built up and and um so these guys have seen the guys go before them. So it's just uh that 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 was really the, the you know, the you know, kind of the impetus behind it. So that's how long you've been there, right? About five or six years, something like that? Yeah, I took the job in the summer of eighteen. This this just okay. finished up our sixth game cycle. Yep. In a totally normal few years. I mean, nothing's really gone on nationally <laughs> or with college football <laughs> or with pandemics, health, et cetera, during that time. But you also you also have a Seattle connection, right? So just before we dig into some of these questions about players, et cetera, what's the Seattle connection for folks that don't know? Yeah, I was I was there my last five years um, before I took this job um, scouting, and and I go bit, way back with John. Uh, my first job in the NFL was in in '96 with the Packers, and John was a a pro scout there, and I was an intern. So we've, I've known John a long time, and uh, I was really fortunate to spend. You know, I was there. I got there the Super Bowl year. I think I was there 13 through 18. Um, so some really good teams, and just you know, really uh, fortunate and grateful that I was able to spend that time with John and Pete, and uh, have some of their leadership style rub off on me and. Uh, learn learn under those guys so it was unbelievable experience unbelievable organization to work for and it made it tough i mean this was a this was a great opportunity for me to stay here in mobile and and uh, watch my son go through high school uh football and basketball and that's really why i did it it was a it was really a family move um but yeah yeah it was it was just you know to bring to bring the lessons i learned from seattle down here was uh was really beneficial who was your big win like who did you really want them to draft that they drafted uh, probably Darren Reed would be the, the biggest one that came to mind. Um, and again, I was, I mean, I had a big old grade on Jaron just because I knew, I knew what he would bring to the locker room. Um, you know, he was the alpha dog in that, in that, on that Alabama defense. And that was, I mean, they had some dudes on that, you know, those 16, 17, 18, uh, defenses in, in Alabama. And, uh, he was the guy and he was exactly what we were looking for, for that locker room and a guy that could handle himself and, and uh, was very serious about football and holding other people accountable. And then obviously he's a great he's a great player too. So uh, so there's that. But I, I would probably say Jaron's the guy that I push most for. And your biggest miss? No, I'm just kidding. We won't do that. <laughs> we, we don't have to do that. Jim Nagy here with us, former scout of the Seahawks, and now running the Senior those. Bowl. <laughs> Any of those? Yeah, I'm doing just an, an awesome job. We had Daniel Jeremiah on uh, just before. Uh, the week of the Senior Bowl, and he said, man, putting together my my first mock draft, it was a little different this year because of so many juniors that have stayed in the extra COVID year that still has not been flushed out. He felt like there was some tremendous top-tier talent, right? Offensive tackles and receivers and everything else, but he had a hard time rounding out the first round with a first-round kind of grade. 
Are you getting that sense, or did maybe the week down there at the Senior Bowl showcase some guys that, hey, hold on just a second, maybe not the biggest name recognition, but there's going to be plenty of first-round guys to fill out uh, those 32 picks? Brock, you're bringing up a really sore subject, man, that DJ mock draft thing. Um, <laughs> so we, he, he and our buddies, we were on the road together for, for a bunch of years, and uh, gosh darn it, he puts out that mock draft, and he's got Byron Murphy from Texas as his number 11 player. He had uh, – Taliesi Fuaga from Oregon State is his number 10 player. And I texted him. I'm like, dude, we're going to lose both those guys now that you put, a, that put out this stupid mock draft. Um, but it, it, and literally, he, he, he texted back. He's like, oh, no, don't say that. And, like, and within an hour, I got a call from, from uh, Byron Murphy's agent. He's like, he's like Jim, I got to pull him. So, uh, no, but no, I, I think I, I really do feel like the first four rounds of this draft are really, really strong. Um, I posted something on social media about this a couple weeks ago leading into our game week. Um, I think day three got completely wiped out. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, we can bring juniors to the game now, so it was a little bit of a different process for us. I couldn't just come out of the shoots and invite, you know, 130 seniors to this game. We had to save some spots for the juniors at every position. But then when, you know, some guys came went back to school, like we said, and we were – that, that junior number topped out. We were in the 140s in 2019, and now we're down in the 50s. Hmm. Um, I mean, think about that. It's like about 90 players that, that are, would be, you know, you know, solid draft picks and for, mo- in the, for the most part um, that now aren't in the draft. So what happened was um, when juniors went back to school um, or if we, you know, we ended up not getting a couple juniors that we wanted to get, the agents, you know, passed on the opportunity – well, then we had to circle back down to the, the next graded seniors, right? It, it, you know, and this this is about a month-long process from the beginning of December to the beginning of January. And by the time we circled back, our day three bore, like the guys that we were circling back to had either, you know, kind of pushed the panic button that they didn't get an invite and jumped in the portal and transferred or just took, N- to you know, signed an NIL deal and went back to school. And that's, and that's coming from the agents and the coaches. That's not, I mean, I, I'm not making that up or mm-hmm. trying to make our game sound like o- overly important. I'm not trying to sound self-important. Um, but that just it came back from a lot of coaches like, man, this kid didn't get a, get an invite and he just kind of got, you know, shook by it. And, and he, you know, he said he wanted to come back. So, I mean, there are some running backs that are going back to college football next year that are going to be fifth and sixth year running backs that, you know, we would have wanted to have in the senior bowl and like really have no business being back in college football. I mean, if you're, I mean, the running back position, we all know where it's at. I mean, you shouldn't be going back for a fifth year. So just a lot of different dynamics at play. So what is just talking about the day three stuff, if you're a team that has, is loaded with a bunch of day three picks, I'm looking to either move those for next year, like trade of this year's fourth for a next year's third or something, but or, or maneuver around in those first four rounds and, and you know, try to trade up to, for some guys that you really want to target. So it'll it'll be interesting once we get to April where teams, you know, strategically – you know, where they land, what they want to do when, when we get to April. Talking to uh, Jim Nagy of the uh, Reese's Senior Bowl. So you worked with John. You know John well. Who are some players that you've seen that seem like John kind of guys? Oh, that's a <laughs> – I, I don't know about that. Um, there is, uh, I mean, you just got to – I don't think – and, again, I don't want to talk out of turn. I don't think even with the new head coach they're going to want to change – the type of player they look for, uh, you know, so I still think they're going to look for, you know, really highly, pedi- highly competitive guys that love football. Um, and, and that's really what they've focused on the last couple of drafts. Why, that's why I think their last couple of drafts have been great. Um, I know that when I was there, you know, we strayed from that a little bit, you know, we, we, we got enticed by talent a couple of times and, and took a couple of risky picks and they didn't pan out. I think they've really done a nice job kind of sticking to their guns and what they say they believe in over the last, you know, two, three drafts, and it's paid off for them. So, um, you know, I think there's going to be guys that there's, you know, the, I know the two tackles are good players up there, um, but I know they, you know, interior offensive line might be an area of need. I think they're, it's loaded. Um, Jackson Powers Johnson from, from Oregon up your way uh, had real, two really good days of practice down here. I think he would be an immediate starter for those guys and, and really upgrade them on the interior. But, I mean, shoot – to say, you know, I don't want to sit here and make it sound like I, I know what mm-hmm. John's plan is. He didn't. He didn't even make it to Mobile this year because he was doing, he was doing the coaching thing. <laughs> so, uh, so I miss seeing my I miss seeing my guy come down. But uh, I know they'll have a plan. They always have a plan.
What did you think about his new, and what do you think about his new partner? Because all those years you were there, it was Pete. All the years that Salk and I have done this show, save for one, it's been the marriage of Pete and John, and those two lockstep together for 14 years. I think they made their way late to Mobile, but maybe you didn't see them together. But when you do come across a Mike McDonald at 36 years of age and John Schneider and no more Pete Carroll, what thought comes to your mind? It's going to be so different, Brock. Um you know, and that's the thing that I don't think that gets talked enough about, and maybe it does up there um, in your market, was, was that marriage. And, in, 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 you know, just seeing it, you know, for five years from the inside and, and, and what it takes for that to work, because it doesn't work everywhere. I've, I've worked for teams where that relationship has blown up a place. Um, you know, that's how I ended up in Seattle. Well, I was in Kansas City, and and the head coach GM thing just did not work at all, and 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 it worked to our detriment. We we didn't win games. So, what they were able to do is incredible. I think I don't know Mike McDonald very well. Uh, people have asked me that. In my only really time I've spent time with him, I went and played in Jim Harbaugh's golf tournament two or three years ago, and we took a bus from Schembechler Hall over to some country club with the coaching staff, and I rode with those guys and got to know them a little bit, but I do not know him well. I, I do I do have a lot of buddies on the Baltimore Ravens scouting staff that speak the world of him, so you know it makes sense that he's getting this opportunity. Um, and I'm just excited to see what he does with that personnel because I know John mentioned that they, they underachieved this year, and I don't get to watch a ton of NFL, but when I do, I watch the Hawks, and you know, to see them play the Rams and they show the Rams starting lineup on defense and it's a bunch of late round picks and, you know, free, you know, pre, you know, pre priority free agent level undrafted free agents and they're getting it done. Raheem Morris is getting it done. And then Seattle's got all these, you know, really talented dudes on defense. Um, I'm excited what Mike McDonald can do with those guys. Hmm. Tell me about the two quarterbacks from the Pac-12. Obviously, uh, you know, we have a little rooting interest here in where Michael Penix goes in the draft, and Lance Nix was there as well. What uh, What did you Bo say? Nix. Bo Nix. Did I say Lance Nix? That's the you old Texas Lance Rangers Nix. second baseman. Gone, gone it's yeah, all. it'll happen to you. <laughs> Bo, Lance, same thing. Uh, tell me about what those two guys were able to accomplish. Yeah, I figured it out where you were going with that. Um they got better every day. I'll say that, you know, it's, it's different down here. And these, it's amazing. I sat with Bo Nix and uh, he's training down here for the draft with, uh, with uh, Drake May from North Carolina and then Carter Bradley from South Alabama, another one of our guys we had in the game. I, w- I, w- I went to one of their workouts a couple of weeks ago and then went in and watched, watched tape of the workout with them. And we were just talking through stuff like these guys, none of them had ever taken a snap from under center ever in their lives. Um, you know, and, and Bo Nix has played for next year in the NFL. It'll be his seventh straight year with a new coordinator. And uh, he's, he played for seven coordinators and never gotten under center. So the first day is always an adjustment for him, right? And they're working with new receivers. So I will say this, there was more completions. Um, usually the first day guys are sp- spraying it around and there's not a lot of familiarity with their guys. But I do feel like there was more completions day one. But they both got better. Uh, you know, Penix didn't play in the game, but, but Bo did. And he put together a really nice drive on his second series and and uh, kind of threw across his body for a touchdown uh, to a tight end from Minnesota. So um, I both thought they, they both got better every day, and that's really all the, that's all, really all the teams are looking for is to see what they can build off. I'm going to go three downs with you. My last three kind of rapid-fire questions here for you. Jim Nagy here, kind enough to take a bunch of time with us. Um, we asked a lot of guys over the course of the season as Penix just took off this year, uh, Jim, and, and from Herb Street to other analysts to everybody, and I'm like, give me a good comp. Come on now, give me a good comp for Michael Penix. Give me somebody, and that is the scouting world, right? You've got this Rolodex of 30 years of different QBs over your time and down there the last six years in Mobile. Penix, remind you of anybody? It's really hard. Like, I saw some – I saw, heard some Tua stuff out there. I don't know if that's just the lefty-to-lefty thing. I think Mike's pretty unique. And, and again, for scouts, like – for us, we don't throw comps around very often. I mean, everything has to line up, right? From like the body type, the skill set, the, the makeup of the player. Like, because when you say that in a draft room, it really has to ring true for the GM and the head coach who you're trying to paint the picture for. So, I'm not trying to like cop out of your your question, mm-hmm. man. But that's that's a hard one. That's a that's a really hard one. I think Mike's a pretty unique player. I really yeah. do. I mean, that's. There, there's not many guys like him. So I, off the top of my head, no, I don't, I don't have one for you. I what is said, it, though? What is it that makes him unique? I know Brock wants to follow up there, but what is it that makes him unique? Because we've gotten that answer from almost everybody. Why is it so hard to find a comp for him? Well, because, you know, he, you, you, he's more of a pocket guy, right? Like, so when I see some of the comps that, you know, 
I've seen some comfortable more mobile quarterbacks. I mean, that's just not Mike's game. Mike's game isn't moving around and making a ton happen. It's from operating in the pocket, which he does a great job of. Um, and then he's, you know, he's a great deep ball thrower, which we know. I've, I've jokingly said, if the Raiders, if uh, Al Davis were still alive, he'd be the Raiders' first round pick. Mm. There's no question about that mm. with the way he throws it vertically. But I think what's underrated is, you know, people, you know, just being able to throw the ball deep and accurately doesn't mean you have a, a really strong arm in terms of like zip on your throws. But but he can rip it too. I think we saw a couple games in the in the college football playoff where he can do that. But but no, I think he's he's just unique. His motion's unique. Um, you know, his ability to stretch the field vertically and, and accurately, and then and then maybe not be as accurate underneath, um, is 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 what makes him different. So no, he's a, he's a unique player. It sure looked like Roger Rosengarten helped himself, huh? He did. He did. You know, and Roger, you know, as, as we all know, played on the right side there at, at UW because of because uh, of Troy on the left side, and sometimes down here that that flip doesn't work. So I know he's putting in. Uh, he'd put in some good work for a couple of weeks before he got here, but I mean, man, it, he he just got done playing three weeks before our game, whereas some of these guys have been done since Thanksgiving. Um, so it's not like he's had a ton of time. I don't know how much he practiced over there, um, but you know, it, flopping sides isn't always easy. And uh, the thing that stood out in terms of like twitch out of his stance, he has left tackle twitch. I do think he's a guy that can swing at the next level. Um, so he had a really nice week. I haven't gotten through all the tape yet because we're still like meeting as a staff and debriefing on what worked and what didn't work. And we're, we're doing a bunch of stuff like that. Um, but from what I saw, and I, I really tried to focus on the big guys during the week, I thought Roger had a really nice week. And then last thing for me, and I love the Jaron Reed conversation earlier, who's a player in your six years that when you talk to these agents and you talk maybe even to the players and others around them, you can say, hey, listen, this one week in Mobile changed this guy's arc. This one week changed his stock. This one week gave the exposure that this guy needed, and it's shown up at the NFL level with him taking off. Is there a player or two over your years, Jim, running it that comes to your mind? Yeah, there, there's usually you know ten to fifteen guys like that every year. But but you know going back to I think it was my second year, I'd say Terry McLaurin. Um, you know Terry was the number two receiver at, at uh, Ohio State behind Paris Campbell, a guy that got drafted by the Colts in the sec- early in this early in the second round. Um, and when we, you know, part of our process is, we, you know, we've got, we had 11 former NFL scouts on our staff and we're, we're doing this the best we can. We're at games every Saturday and we're watching tape and everything, but th- this game is for the team. So like the, the last part of our process is I get on calls with usually about half the league every year and we just go position by position, you know, of, of you know, and comparing notes and comparing grades. And I, I do that up in Seattle with, with their guys every year. And, uh, you know, when, when we did those calls that year, Terry McLaurin, everybody had him in the fifth and the sixth round, which is, uh, and really, I honestly, I, and I said it when he came down here, we invited him because of what he did as a gunner on punt team. I mean, that's where you saw the speed. And then he comes down here and he doesn't, you know, they don't run a lot of routes at Ohio state comes down here. Nobody can cover him. Uh, we have the same zebra technology GPS stuff that all 32 NFL teams do. They're one of our partners. He was the fastest guy in the game that year. And he was, he was, so he was fast. He was uncoverable. Um, and I said it when he left the week that someday Terry McLaurin could run a fortune 500 company. And I'm not talking about like a, a little company down here in Mobile, Alabama. Like he could go to a fortune, <laughs> like that's the kind of leader this guy is like he's off the charts. <laughs> and so to see him become a pro bowl player and he went in the third round. So we went from like a fifth or sixth rounder to the third. And now in hindsight was a bit way underdrafted. Like you, you redraft the whatever that draft was, the 2019 draft that Terry was in, he would have been a, easily been a first-round draft pick. So um, that's just one of them, Brock. So, awesome. But uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of guys.